Hello, welcome to today's ILTA YouTube session entitled AI is my co-pilot. I'm your moderator, Eric Miller, Innovation Analyst, Taft, Satinius and Hollister, LLP. I'm joined today with Patrick Sklodowski, Principal, Square 10 Solutions, LLC, and Alex Smith, Global Head, Product Management, iManage. Uh, Patrick, you want to give a quick introduction? Yeah, good morning. Hi, I'm Patrick Sklodowski. I'm one of the principals of Square 10. Uh, we're a systems integrator who works primarily with law firms, and I've been working in and around law firms for almost 20 years. Great. Alex? Hey, I'm Alex Smith. I'm a senior product director here at iManage, look after AI search and knowledge. Um, before that, I was at a law firm as an innovation lead. Great. Dive into the questions then. First one, and we'll go with Alex first and then Patrick. Copilot, what do firms need to do to get ready for it? And what did you have to do to get ready for it? Um, so I'm going to say three things. So one, data. Um, get your data in good order um, before you start thinking about how to expose that to Copilot. Um, it, that then leads on to information architecture and how do you ground things on that information architecture. And I guess the last one, and I'm sure we'll come back to this a few times, is use cases. So what are the actual use cases for Copilot? You know, Copilot at the moment on the advert say it can do everything. So what are the actual use cases you want to get your data in order for? Um, you want to kind of roll out to users. You want to actually get people to use and adopt. I think your other question from 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 our side, and obviously I work for a vendor, is um, I'm sure we'll come on to that. Is you know how do you integrate that con the right content for the right use cases into that kind of copilot environment? But I'm sure we'll come on to that later. It's been a fun few months trying to think about that, especially since copilot went GA at the end of last year. And I can uh, I'll I'll take in a little deeper on that one. That was a, an awesome start from Alex, though. Um, we've had the same experiences as law firms because we're a professional company as well. And um, Copilot was sort of sprung on the world, became publicly available uh, with almost no notice for, for most of us. And so for, for uh, a firm perspective, those who weren't in the early adopter stage really just was all of a sudden there. So some of the things that we've really needed to look at and all of our clients are looking at it ranges from the, the licensing to making sure they're on the correct version of Office. There are a lot of really large questions right now around what the version of Office, but specifically the version of Outlook. Uh, Microsoft is pushing that everyone should go to the new version of Outlook, uh, but they've been slowly integrating Copilot into what we'll call Outlook Classic. Um, everything that I'm seeing out there shows that Microsoft's going to continue to add features into Outlook Classic. I just haven't seen really well-defined timelines, uh, or they're missing the timelines that they've uh, sort of published to the world. Uh, the other really big things are make sure you're in Microsoft 365, primarily uh, Exchange Online and OneDrive. We've had a couple of clients who've toyed with Copilot when they have not been in Office 365 for email or OneDrive, and the experience has been lacking. Uh, we've also found a few firms that when they've moved mailboxes from Exchange on-prem to Exchange Online after implementing Copilot, they ran into some production problems with those mailboxes. Um, we can only attribute that to Copilot because it was the only uh, outlying factor, but we, we think that that's really a, a not a good idea to start toying around with Copilot much for users whose data is on-prem. The other really big issues, and I think we're gonna get into these a little later, are around security and compliance. Uh, making sure that your M365 tenant is, is secure. Uh, obviously, MFA, uh, your conditional access policies to control security access uh, and your, build your security boundary. Uh, but on the InfoGov uh, and data government, governance side, um, we're starting to see a real push from Microsoft around sensitivity labels, which we'll come to, I think, in a couple of questions, um, and organizing your data, making sure that things are well organized, that um, security controls, just normal permissions are in place. And then the last really big item is training. Um, we're going to get into workflows, but understanding the workflows, making sure people know how to craft prompts. There, there can be a big learning curve there. 
uh, building your training around the workflows that you define and where you think there's going to be value for Copilot and making sure that that training is, I'll say, both interactive and uh, iterative. Uh, interactive, if I'm working with a practice group or a business unit, uh, understanding what they're doing and making sure the trainer can uh, adapt the training based off the needs of that group where possible or the questions that come in. And, and as we're all learning co-pilot along the way, the training's probably going to change over the course of the next few weeks and months. Great. Thank you both. Um, next question, and we'll go with Patrick and then Alex on this one. So how are vendors integrating or what third-party integrations do you see to integrate Copilot and AI into products? This is going to be a really great question for Alex to answer coming from the vendor side. Um, today, we're not seeing uh, a lot of major integration, but I think all of our clients are talking to their vendors about what's coming. Um, we are seeing some use of some of the native Microsoft tools. As an example, there is the ability to put a connector in place to pull from a file server on-prem and take that metadata and bring it into the semantic index in Copilot. Uh, I'm also aware that there are a lot of third-party integrations that um, are pre-built between Microsoft and vendors to allow additional data to come into those, um, uh, come into Copilot as well for searching and for um, uses uh, in the AI. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, th I think there's a few things going on here. I think um, number one is the vendors are building features into their products. Now they are AI features. Um, they met those features will kind of go along a bit of a spectrum. Some will be features that help you get things you already should have done in that, that product done slightly better. Um, and, and obviously the question around things like search and semantic search, Patrick mentioned semantic search there as well. I, I think there are features which are now possible because of AI that weren't possible before. So that might be something like enriching content in a, in a system. Um, it might be cleaning up content. It might be securing content using features which probably were very manual before. So I think you'll see improvements there. And I guess, you know, many of those vendors will add um, new features which are capable, which will almost be like product lines. And I'm sure over time there'll be some acquisitions in the market of various of the new uh, products which have emerged. I think the other one is kind of the question I think, Patrick, you were touching on was like the integrations piece. You know, if let's say Copilot becomes, you know, the single pane of glass in Word or the single pane of glass when you're working in Excel or Teams, what things need to integrate with that? Now, one way of integrating with that could be just integrating content into that Teams environment. In, in essence, it's a grounded search behind Copilot that's going on. The other one, which obviously I see a lot because I work when, with one of the trusted repositories um, providers, is that how does Copilot interface with where your trusted content and secured content is um, and allow you to get the right outcome? So it's not necessarily about moving content from one place to the other. It could well be that Copilot talks to services within the places where you store and look after either, you know, in my area, my area documents in other areas, uh, you know, kind of key in insights and metadata. So I think the integrations are fun at the moment because there's talks of moving content one way, there's talks about Copilot talking into other places. But I think Patrick's point to the other question before about, you know, the important things here are, what do you trust to move? How secure is that? What happens when and if you do other things with the content? So a lot of API conversations at the moment happening between various people and obviously, you know, how Copilot works. And, and I'd say personally, I just, you know, Copilot's at quite an, you know, not necessarily a fully mature moment at the moment. So there will be different solutions for, for now. And those solutions may mature differently over the next 18, 24 months. Great. Thank you. Um, next question. We'll start with you, Alex, and then go over to Patrick. How can firms use Copilot and AI? with their existing workflows and technology? So I think last year was a year of experimentation. So I think people were doing some interesting things. They were moving things around, save content, 
having a play with things. I think this year is very much about finding those use cases. And Eric, your question's really spot on because you mentioned the word workflows. It's about how do you how do you integrate the right, I don't know, additional features, features, brand new things like Copilot into those workflows and do they change the workflows? So, you know, a workflow at the moment might be that you know, a, an associate summarizes a document that that then goes to a more senior associate. That senior associate then reviews that as part of document review. That then goes somewhere else and the summary gets sent as part of an email that goes out. Now, obviously, with something like Copilot, you could be summarizing that document automatically. What does that do to your workflow? So now what that may be is it just slightly improves it or it speeds it up. But I think over time, what's going to happen, and, and in my previous role as an innovation person at a firm, you are going to have to start to break down some of those workflows and think about how you might do those workflows differently. So as I said, I think the use cases remain incredibly important because ultimately people at firms who look after process and how matters are run are going to need to start to think about, am I doing something slightly better or am I doing, am I re-engineering this? And I think, you know, I think that's going to be the important part of really understanding what these do. And I think the other thing is going to be about understanding how accurate they are and what new processes need to go on top of these. So, you know, saying that something can do a contract review using one of these tools, are you still going to now need to add another human process on top of that to actually review the outputs and where those go? So it's not just about necessarily making current practice a little bit faster, it could well be about adding new stages and new checks. And that might still be faster, but these are new processes that come in. So I I kind of struggle to understand how this could just go without kind of some level of process review or going into process re-engineering. Yeah, it's, it's almost like there's a, a need, more of a need for a business analyst type of role in, in firms where firms may not have had that in the past to really understand those workflows, how the practices are working, how the business units are working. Uh, it may change the role of trainers to some degree. And we're going to have to really focus on that, again, that prompt training and maybe develop some internal prompt engineers who really begin to learn how to develop the prompts and then expand that training to the users for their workflow. Um, you know, a few other things are right now, there's definitely should be a lot of experimentation. And does this work? And how does it work? Is it giving me what I need when I'm performing a certain, um, asking a certain question? Um, there are some capabilities in M365 to measure the use. Uh, and you know, we're highly recommending that as folks are developing their work, work cases and uh, how they're going to use the workflows, to look at those metrics, see who's using Copilot regularly, what benefit are they getting, talking to them, querying those people who are having success with that to be able to train the rest of the firm. And those uh, metrics are in the M365 dashboard. Microsoft is also adding um, some capabilities in, I think it's Viva Insights. There's gonna be some reporting there. Um, Firms can also look at doing a Microsoft readiness assessment for Copilot. So some of the Microsoft partners are capable of doing that and are, are ready to go. That's something that we've been uh, starting to do with our clients. Very specific uses, uh, summaries of Teams meetings, but uh, don't trust that they are 100% accurate and a little bit of trust but verify but it can be very good at summarizing what happened during a meeting, providing action items, providing minute meetings, uh, summaries of large email threads. If uh, I have any, an email thread that I haven't read any of, it maybe has six to 10 messages, I might ask it to summarize it for me very quickly. We're today not seeing a lot of great use in Excel, uh, but in Word and PowerPoint and, and particularly Teams, we're seeing a lot uh, the other area that we're seeing many clients really spend more time with Copilot is uh, in Edge, leaving the Copilot um, uh, window uh, on the sidebar open and trying to integrate that into their daily workflow. Um, business business services today seems to be getting the biggest focus from many of our clients and how it can help with their workflows. I think there's a little bit of 
hesitancy appropriately of beginning to use Copilot in legal practice today is, again, it's so new and we're all still learning so much about where it's going to be. And that leads right into our next question. Thank you. We'll go Patrick and then Alex. Are there security concerns or negatives you think that are important to highlight about Copilot and Gen AI? Yeah, you, you may have to cut me off at some point. I could probably go for 10 minutes on the security concerns. Um, I mean, the key thing for Copilot is all of your data, um, all the indexing is stored within your M365 tenant, and it is appropriately secured by Microsoft. Cloud being a shared security, shared responsibility model, again, going back to you have to make sure that the boundaries are properly controlled. People can only get into what they need to get into. Copilot respects the security and access controls around your data. So if I have a team that's only accessible by certain people and they perform, a, a ask a question in Copilot, it will only surface the data that they have access to. However, if we're not well-structured in how we're storing data in that Microsoft environment, Copilot's making it much easier to surface information. The information may have already been there. Maybe it's HR data that I shouldn't have access to. Maybe it's partner compensation data that I shouldn't have access to. But if it was put into Teams or any location that is becoming part of the index and done in such a way that I do have access and I shouldn't have, the capabilities of Copilot for me to type in a, a question and for it to correlate that data it's making it easier for me to surface that information. So that security model around all of your data is going to be really critical. And from a um, data governance perspective, if that data leaves my organization and goes somewhere else into a client or a business partner's M365 tenant, and they store the data somewhere that is easily found or accessible by people it shouldn't be accessible to, again, in that other environment, Copilot's gonna make it easier to surface that data or put those correlations together. So we're beginning to go down the path with a lot of firms of talking about uh, sensitivity labels in M365 and how that can be applied to the data so that the label travels with the document. And if I secure, secure a document so that only the three of us have access to it, it doesn't matter where in the world that document travels, only the three of us will have access to it. So there's going to be a, there already is a really big push from Microsoft on the use of sensitivity levels, labels, excuse me, but it, it's not because they're changing the way we do things. It's because it can be so much easier to surface that data, making sure that the document, the data itself is protected um, if our overall structure is not, not, uh, not done appropriately. Thank you, Patrick. Alex? Um, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd echo some of those those points that are made there, right? You know, this is, in at least for Copilot, it, it is kind of, in essence, a search that's happening under the bonnet. It's a highly performance search, and it's, you know, one that has a lot more ways to more, you know, quickly get to those answers. So I think the same issue that's always happened, you know, if you put on a very good search engine onto a, a system and that system isn't properly secured, strangely, the top results are often the ones you don't want them to be. So... You know, the more you put the, the, the microscope on this, the more you, you'll see things. I think just to add to some other points on that, number one is, you know, at the moment, something like Copilot is trying to go across everything. So you've got to think about where do you really want it to point to? Not just what people have access to or not, but where do you really want, where do you think the answer is to something? So again, think about it from, from my, my world, the document management world. I hold a lot of things like versions, previous copies, you know, kind of half drafts, et cetera. Do you want the answer to come from that? Or do you want the answer to come from a final document? Do you want an answer to come from a trusted data set, like a knowledge set when you ask a certain question? And ultimately, you know, the, the answers that come out are very convincing. So it's not always on a, on a previous set of search results, humans could kind of look at it and go, there's the authority. I don't trust that. That's obviously a version. That's not necessarily going to be as clear now. So I think that's one side. And you kind of asked a slightly broader question around mm -hmm. AI. I think the broader question on AI is, my view is that anything that comes out of this should be grounded on your content. So your organization's content. 
but there are still quite a few tools out there. We talk about prompt engineers, et cetera, where they are just prompt engineering these uh, LLMs raw. That's not good, right? You, you really don't know what's in those. So however good a prompt engineer you are and you're just prompting an LLM, that's not your trusted data set. So at least with Copilot, it's grounding itself. And, and, and so you should be looking at tools that ground themselves. But obviously, to Patrick's point, once you start grounding it, it's like, what is it grounding on? Is it secure? Is it the right things to target the right questions to? And is the security being applied, you know, in, a, in an appropriate way? Great. Thank you. We're going to dive in. Last question. We'll say 30, 30 seconds each. Look into the future. We'll go Alex and then Patrick. What impact do you think Copilot and Gen AI are going to have on the way we work? So I'll put my previous hat on as an innovation manager, and I remember this. There's incremental change and there's big change. You know, there's kind of groundbreaking transformational change. And everyone's talking about transformational. I think if you were to look at Copilot right now, it's incremental. You know, some of the things are quite administrative. They're a better meeting set of, you know, meeting notes or, you know, I was on the move. So, you know, kind of summarize my emails. That's not groundbreaking, but it's saving half an hour or an hour of my time. I think the fun's going to be is when this starts to this and other Gen AI tools are start to prove themselves and are accurate on more substantive legal tasks. And that's going to be when you have to then start to transform either change the work you're doing now majorly or more excitingly do work that you've never been able to do before because you've got better access to data and law firms can do more work, more interesting work that starts to grow the business. I'd actually like to ask Alex a follow-up question to that. And, and Alex, I'm, I'm curious, I completely agree that right now it's it's the, the smaller changes and it's not yet transformational. Um, from what you're seeing, do you feel like there's a, a time frame for it to become truly transformation, transformational across a wide uh, breadth of firms? I think, I think shorter term, I think people will focus on that incremental change and what do I do with two or three extra hours in a day, in a matter, in a bill that goes out, you know, whilst we're still probably on quite billable time counting. I think probably the three to four years, three to five year framework will start to get into the truly transformational or new interesting work and changes the way that lawyers do things. And that that means that the AI has to prove itself on substantive legal tasks rather than, as I said, time saver tasks. I love that answer. And I think we're we're very much in the in the hype cycle and everyone needs to be testing and looking and seeing where it can help the business. Uh, I, I do think we're going to see a lot of hype for the next few months, uh, next year or so, and then it may die down a little bit. And as firms are seeing real use cases, um, some people are, uh, are looking for a problem for this to solve and haven't quite found the problem. Um, as opposed to seeing the transformational need. So we're gonna definitely see that over the next uh, over the next couple of years. Well, great, thank you so much, Patrick and Alex for your time today. We really appreciate it. I hope those tuning in to the session later will find great value. Um, we also wanna invite you to join us for the next Technology Solutions live roundtable discussion. It's coming on May 9th, entitled Mastering Your Mailbox, Effective Management of Outlook mailbox. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to ILTA's YouTube channel. We appreciate the support.